Hi. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 41st um, Antoinette Brown Lecture. This series celebrates the profound impact of Brown in the lives and work of female theologians, and it recognizes the continued concerns faced by women in ministry today. Um, before we begin, I would like to thank all of the people in the F ABL committee, many of whom could not be here tonight, but Chelsea Overstreet is here, and she's done tons of help with all of this. Um, I am thankful for their passion and desire to be the next generation of female theologians, as well as many other of my Vanderbilt um, colleagues there. Um, also, I'd like to thank Sylvia Saunders Kelly for the generous donations that she's given to allow this lecture series to continue, uh, Shatika Brown for her outstanding organizational skills, all of which helped to make tonight's event come together, um, Dean Emily Towns for her dedication to fostering a climate in which all voices, especially those that are traditionally silenced, have space to speak, and Professor Bonnie Miller McLemore for her charity, or for her charitably giving of her time tonight, um, is for just the opportunity to come and speak to us. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. It is miserable outside and dreary, and I appreciate you coming and just supporting the fact that these conversations do need to continue to happen. Um, so thank you so very much, and I now present to you Dean Emily Towns. Good evening. It is so good to see so many here tonight. We never know. Um, with evening lectures this time of the year, um, if folks are still yet alive. So it seems that there are many people yet alive, and that is a good thing. Uh, just a little bit about Ante Antoinette. Louisa Brown Blackwell. She was born in Henrietta, New York on May 20th, 1825, and began to speak publicly in the services of the local congregational church at age nine. She graduated from Oberlin College in 1847 and completed its theological seminary in 1850, though she was not granted her degree. Oberlin later conferred on her an honorary Master of Arts in 1878 and a Doctor of Divinity in 1908. She was refused ordination because of her sex, yet she held a Congregationalist pastorate in South Butler, New York for four years and later became the first ordained woman minister in the United States in 1853. Professor Miller McLemore will tell you more about her for she was, quite frankly, a remarkable woman. And it is our honor to be celebrating the Oberlin roots of the Divinity School. So we are pleased to offer this lecture in Antoinette Brown's honor and memory. This year, the lecturer is Professor Bonnie Miller McLemore. Bonnie J. Miller McLemore is the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Professor of Religion, Psychology, and Culture at the Divinity School and the Graduate Department of Religion of Vanderbilt University. Her research in religion, psychology, and culture, pastoral and practical theology, and women and childhood studies focuses on understanding the person and lived theology in the midst of everyday struggles, such as illness, dying, working, and parenting. She teaches courses on personality theory, self-psychology, women and religion, families and children, spirituality and pastoral care, pastoral and practical theology, and methods in theology and science. A Henry Luce III Fellow in Theology, Louisville Sabbatical Grant recipient, author, co-author, an editor of 15 books, as well as numerous chapters and articles. Her recent publications include Children 
and Childhood in American Religions, 2009. In the Midst of Chaos, Care of Children as Spiritual Practice, 2006. And The Game Changer, Wiley Blackwell Companion to Practical Theology, a mammoth undertaking that I don't know how one person could have been the editor for so many people and not killed any of them. <laughs> or perhaps she did. <laughs> Published in 2014. A nationally and internationally recognized leader in pastoral and practical theologies and women in childhood studies in theology, she has served as president of the International Academy of Practical Theology, president of the Association of Practical Theology, and co-chair of two program units of the American Academy of Religion, the Consultation on Childhood Studies and Religion, and the Group on Practical Theology. In addition to her Luce and Louisville Awards, she, was also, she has also received grants from the Lilly Endowment Foundation, the Association of Theological Schools, the Wabash Center on Teaching and Learning in Religion and Theology, the Vanderbilt University for the Study of Families, and Vanderbilt University for the Study of Families, Children, and Religion, Research on Practical Theology, Research on Public Theology, and Exploration of Teaching and Vocation. Ordained in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, she has served as an associate pastor, as a chaplain, and pastoral counselor while completing her MA and PhD at the University of Chicago in 1986. Bonnie and I go way back. I mean, way back, over 30 years. And it is my honor to be introducing her tonight as this year's Antoinette Brown Lecturer and her intriguing title, Mothers, Children, and Theological Knowledge. Please join me in welcoming Bonnie Miller McLemore. Thank you, Emily. I have so many quick thanks I want to give. Um, yes, Emily, for the invitation. It's such an honor. Um, and Jacqueline Morris for keeping in touch with me by email, and Shatika Brown for all you are doing. In fact, I think you're trying to get that picture back up. <laughs> um, and Chris Benda, who may or may not be here, but he has been a life send in terms of re library research for me. Peter Caprata, who you may or may not get to benefit from all the work he did on getting some photos for this tonight. And students that are in my current craft of academic research course, where we are together sharing the anxieties and joys of writing. Um, and you have been a part of my journey in putting together this lecture. Um, and uh, last but not least, I, my husband, Mark, and I wish I had some pictures of my kids as part of the uh, slideshow because they are very much present in everything I'm going to be talking about. So is it back up or should I wait? Should take it? I've got some great pictures if it shows up. I'm going to, if you all don't mind just waiting for a second, I'll sit tight. It lets me catch my breath. I think, you know, this, in terms of audiences, it's much easier to fly in and fly out. <laughs> I could be with you all for the next several years, right? So. Should I wait? What does this mean? Okay. All right. 
One night in May 1838, when Antoinette Brown was almost 13, Angelina Grimke, Lucinda Mott, and a few other women spoke publicly in Pennsylvania Hall, a place built for speeches supporting abolition and women's rights. There were violent demonstrations, and the hall was burned to the ground. Today, most of us take women's right to speak for granted. We accept and even expect women to contribute to the construction of knowledge. But history reminds us that this was not always the case. People once rioted and raised a, hub, a public hall when women spoke out against slavery and women's subordination. <laughs> I have to tell you, I have some really good pictures. Which we'll go back to. Will that help it to? OK. It worked great this afternoon, of course. So. OK, so people once rioted and raised a public hall to the ground when women spoke out against slavery and women's subordination. Nor is subordination and suppression of women's theological knowledge a thing of the past. The majority of the world's Christian communities and most religions today still do not recognize women as religious leaders or thinkers. I came across the story of the fire because I wondered whether Antoinette Brown was a mother, and if so, how her motherhood affected, formed her and particularly her theology. And the more I read, the more convinced I became that she illustrates provocatively my argument that mothers and children have a great um, have a greater role in, con in constructing theology than history and scholarship have acknowledged or accorded them. In the next hour, I want to take you on a journey that develops this first claim through an examination of Antoinette's life and through a f reflection on maternal knowledge and knowledge in childhood. In each instance, I am asking how theology is shaped by our temporal, physical bodies. Do people know the divine or think about divinity differently as we pass through pivotal stages of life. This question is deeply connected with my longtime interest in practical knowledge and in its academic neglect. As a nursing scholar, Patricia Benner, points out, the knowledge embedded in practice, that is, knowledge that is accrued over time, it has gone understudied, uncharted, and un un misunderstood. But what happens to our sense of the human when it is divorced from a grasp of ourselves as beings in time? In this lecture, I hope to spark your imagination about what scholars have missed by constructing theology as static and disembodied, as an, intellect, as an intellectual and elite exercise whose presumed subject is the unchanging adult. With mothering and children as ground for imagination, beginning with Antoinette Brown as a fascinating example, I uncover a reality, often bracketed, that knowledge is rooted in and shaped by physical bodies that change over time. Years ago, people burned to the ground a hall symbolizing human freedom because women spoke out. Tonight, I turn the heat on a different hall suggesting that Antoinette's life and the exploration of motherhood and childhood can undo structures that have undergirded where and how theology happens and open up new ways of thinking. Theological educators widely recognize Antoinette as the first ordained woman and a spokesperson for women's rights and abolition. But this is often the extent of our knowledge, even after years of attending lectures and her namesake in my own case. Actually, as I discovered, few scholars have studied her. I found only one biography, and it grew out of an undergraduate term paper at Oberlin that an editor at Feminist Press just fortunately decided was worthy of publication. She is the least well-known of the 19th century pioneers in the women's movement 
as sociologist Alice Rossi suggests. But Bill Rossi adds a very provocative comment, but in my view, she says the most interesting. Nettie, as Rossi and Nettie's family and friends called her, earns Rossi's respect because she had, in Rossi's words, a far more finely honed intellect than most of the early leaders, as sharp as and pure intellectual reasoning as Elizabeth Stanton's was in political and ideological thinking. I found additional reasons for admiration. Nettie was one of the first US women to attend college. A prolific writer of several books, in fact, one list said 11 books and articles. And finally, in answer to my initial question, also a mother of seven children, two of whom died in childbirth and eventually a grandmother. This, oh my goodness, the pictures are up there. I love that one. <laughs> to discover that she wrote at all is kind of amazing. But to learn that she had several children and as many books, countering a prevailing myth that a woman either has children or writes books is a little short of incredible. I have been as surprised, however, by how few people know about the, these facts. Her intellectual pursuits and childbearing surely influenced her theology, but even less is known or said about this if she is claimed as a first wave feminist theologian at all. On the question of how being a woman and mother informed her theology, I think the adverse processes are as telling as the accomplishments. In the mid-1800s, educational institutions forbid women from obtaining theological training, and Oberlin College, the institution with which we are indelibly linked, was no exception. A hotbed of anti-slavery sediments, it was considerably less progressive on women's rights. Oberlin only capitulated to her petition for admission into theology in 1847 on the condition that she enter as a resident graduate and not receive a degree. Mrs. Charles G. Finney, whose husband became one of her more supportive professors, begged her not to consider further study, contending in Nettie's words, quote, you will never feel yourself wise enough to go directly against the opinions of all the great men of the past. Only one professor supported women's public speaking to what were tellingly labeled promiscuous or mixed audiences of men and women in the 1940s, and he was consistently outvoted by the rest of the faculty. Another professor assigned an essay on the biblical passages commanding women's silence, which simply inspired Nettie to argue all the more for a woman's public speaking in a paper that turned into one of her first published articles to, and efforts to reconstruct theology. Not surprisingly, these educational challenges pale next to those of congregational life. We celebrate Nettie's ordination, but sel seldom do we recognize that she left her first appointment in a Congregationalist church in New York after less than a year, and never returned to Congregational ministry except as pastor emeritus of a Unitarian church in her 80s at the turn of the century. So Nettie is at once a sign of hope and a symbol of women's ongoing ecclesial and theological disillusionment. Sources typically explain her departure as a result of a lack of sources, resources, or a growing religious doubt, but behind these shorthand explanations lie a host of revealing details that include not just congregational chauvinism and a crisis of faith on her part, but also intense pressure from close friends in the women's movement, Lucy Stone, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony, all of whom looked with disfavor upon her church affiliation, seeing little redemptive about the church's corrupt institutional hierarchy. 
Meanwhile, the woman, the women who com comprised the church's majority to whom she remained loyal, expected a minister to be kind of a father figure who represented a God who was also our father. Neither meeting this physical criteria or able to abide by the orthodox Calvinist damnation of the unconverted, her situation finally reached a climax when she refused to interpret the death of a child born outside marriage as divine retribution or threaten the dying youth with eternal suffering to provoke his conversion. But even more obstacles impeded the theological work that she was poised to do, forces that will be as familiar to many women today as, as those that I have already named. She married and had children. Some historians actually attribute her political success to marrying into one of the most prominent uh, 19th century reform clans, the Blackwells. But the more I read, the less sure I was about this. Although her well-known sisters-in-law, Emily and Elizabeth, were the first women to, to earn US medical degrees and progressive in some very many respects, they were incredibly provincial in their view of marriage and harbored a deep distrust and even antipathy towards physicality, sexuality, and men. They came from a long line of women who didn't marry and a long family that did not. And they welcomed Nettie's marriage, of course, to their brother, but they remained highly critical of how she raised her five daughters. If there is a Blackwell silver lining, it is Brother Sam, who becomes Antoinette Brown Blackwell's partner in a uniquely cooperative marriage. But he simultaneously contributes to the exponential growth of her domestic demands. Rossi describes Nettie as, quote, the only Blackwell, the only one in the Blackwell clan who seemed to have a sexually gratifying relationship. And she bore the consequences. She continues to speak, preach, and write, but according to her biographer, she found it difficult in addition to her responsibilities at home. After her third daughter, her work as minister and lecturer was at a standstill, leading a very short-sighted historian to suggest that Nettie's, quote, feminist work ended after marriage, unquote. To imply that Nettie's work ended is odd and inaccurate. All that this standstill suggests is that factors that still impinge on scholarship and theology today inhibited Nettie. Male-centered constructions of church, God and pastoral work, competing cultural narratives about the proper feminist approach to Christianity and to marriage, and last but not least, household work. As caught between adversarial cultures as many women are today, she experienced tensions with her church and family because of her feminism and theology. And she struggled with her feminist friends because of her faith and family. Despite these conditions, Nettie actually made some significant contributions for which she receives minimal credit, the most important of which, in my mind, centers on her persistent and insistent affirmation of women's intellect, including effort to determine, quote, how to combine intellectual culture, as she titles one essay, with household management and family duty. However, like other women of her time disillusioned by the church's rejection, she turned from a direct confrontation with traditional Christianity to science as the rising arbiter of truth. Now, this turn is of particular interest to me as someone in psychology and religion, especially her criticism of evolutionary theories that influenced Freud and others. Although people picture modern science as enlightened in contrast to religion's dogmatism, Nettie was just as excluded among scientists as among pastors. When it came to women, children, people of color, and people of different sexualities, science was no less repressive and ambiguous. People used Charles Darwin and Herbert Spencer's so-called laws of nature to make sweeping claims that intermingle sexist, racist, heterosexist and ageist ideology, grouping children, the colonized other, 
the so-called unsexed and women together as dreaded and lesser. They argued, for example, that women were mentally and physically more like savages and children than like men, that women's brains were smaller than those of men and therefore incapable of higher thought, that, physical, that limited physical and intellectual activity produced healthier babies, and that both sport and education would lead to unsexed women and race suicide. In response, Nettie makes several intellectual moves that challenge the foundation of knowledge in both science and theology, and in the 1800s foreshadow arguments by modern day feminists and postmodernists. In her second, I've actually forgot I even have it up there. In what was her second, actually her third book, because she also wrote a novel, but in her second academic book, and maybe what I think is her most important one, The Sexes Throughout Nature, she disavows both the Bible's ability to resolve modern gender questions and she disputes the competence of male scientists. The scientist, as she says in her words, is, quote, compelled to see everything in the light of his own convictions. Indeed, the more active and dominant one's opinions, the more liable they must be to modify his rendering of related facts, roping them inadvertently into the undue service of his theories." Unquote. Beyond this, scientists assume the male as the representative type or standard and the female as the exception, or in her words, a modification preordained in the interest of reproduction and in that interest only or chiefly. I think an assertion so closely resembling those made by 20th century feminists about developmental psychology and moral theory that they could have quoted her. Finally, women have knowledge about women based on where they stand as women that surpasses what male scientists can know from the outside. Rather than being unqualified, they are more qualified, in her words, to make authoritative claims about these issues. According to religion historians Elizabeth Munson and Greg Dickinson, this crusade to establish women's epistemological authority in both theology and science was prescient or foreshadowing of contemporary standpoint theory. She particularized her text, situated authority within context, and placed knowledge within the realm of personal experience. By doing so, she effectively challenged biblical and scientific modes of knowing by using the very language used against women to support them. From this standpoint, Nettie essentially turns Darwinian theory on its head, using ideas about natural selection and survival of the fittest to argue that not only do women need to exercise their brains, the survival of humanity depends upon it. Reminiscent of her scriptural argument against women's silence in church, she makes clear that nothing good comes from keeping women ignorant and dependent. In fact, forced inactivity of half of the human race will drag down the entire species. As important, if women have evolved specialized capacities for direct nurture of offspring, then men must assume secondary tasks of indirect sustenance, such as cooking, sewing, and producing food, thereby freeing women to develop their intellectual capacities, a view that her biographer describes as unique, even among liberal reformers of her time. However, for all their attention to Nettie as an early instance of standpoint theory, Munson and Dickinson never once mention her work as wife and mother as a side of knowledge, even though they explore her examination of reproduction, sex, and distribution of household labor, which she undoubtedly studied in the midst of managing a household and raising five young children. Consequently, they essentially sideline experiences critical to her construction of knowledge. Her home duties and interests, she writes, were of real value in this work, even in the direction of theology, in her words, just as they also deprived her of the time to harmonize what she called the many-sided questions. 
her husband and, quote, the helpfulness of the little children when they came saved me from despair and shaped her understanding of human nature and divinity. From this very material position, she essentially undermines the cult of true womanhood, perpetuated by both religion and science, by adopting what I think I'd like to call an epistemology of the body. I'm partly borrowing here from one of our own graduates in preaching, Beverly Zink Sawyer, who describes that women speaking out publicly constituted what she calls a doubly subversive act, a twofold act of defiance. That is, they defied social norms through their words and through their bodies as women speaking before so-called promiscuous audiences. Political advocacy for slaves, housewives, prostitutes, and child laborers transgress social norms, but people could excuse this as an act of selflessness that fit the ideology of womanhood. But by promoting themselves and by moving their female identified bodies into public, political spaces, they went beyond the pale. Thus, as Zink Zoyer concludes, the platform of public speaking became at once the vehicle for promoting a political message and a symbol of this message itself by the very embodiment of the speaker's words in the form of a woman speaking publicly. And for Nettie, this included a display of her procreative activity and domesticity. One final observation. There is an odd parallel in how Vanderbilt and the United Church of Christ have named a lecture and an award respectively in Nettie's honor, retaining her birth name, Antoinette Brown, but excising her marital name, even though she was distinct among her progressive colleagues in combining and using in her appearances and publications Antoinette Brown Blackwell. This selective renaming inevitably expunges an important part of her life. Now, I am, of course, reading lots more into this than I should. She was, after all, unmarried and Antoinette Brown when she was ordained. But to use this name in, per in perpetuity arrests her growth in history and reinforces a limited grasp of her full theological contribution. Ultimately, for me, it raises the disconcerting question of whether there is something about marriage and motherhood that makes theological education shy away. For these are not the only occasions when maternal knowledge has been expunged from the record. Twenty years ago, when I interviewed for my job at Vanderbilt, I spoke about my second book published that year, Also a Mother, Work and Family as Theological Dilemma. Peter Hodgson, coincidentally the Charles G. Finney Professor of Theology, now emeritus, asked me, so what's theological about work and family? Peter's question suggests how hard it has been for 20th century scholars, not just Peter, to grapple with theology as practiced and written within ordinary life, women's lives in particular. We also see how Finney's legacy lives on today, supporting and questioning women's public voices. But nonetheless, it is actually a great question, which he asked out of genuine curiosity. And as any good question, it has been a stimulus for much further thought for me. Two decades before I arrived at University of Chicago Divinity School for doctoral stu study, Valerie Saving Goldstein wrote a now widely recognized graduate paper at Chicago, published a few years later in 1960 in one of the premier religion journals. It began with a bold sentence for its time, I am a student of theology, I am also a woman. Her effort to show how women's experiences challenge traditional Christian assumptions about love and sin marks the advent of second wave US feminist theology despite the nearly two decade law that followed its publication, saving for she divorced and returned to her birth name and is best known uh, under that. 
And she's best known for her insight that the prideful self-assertion or will to power about which modern theologians from Kierkegaard to Reinhold Niebuhr fretted is less a temptation for many women than denial or even ignorance about one's own desires and needs. Although there are flaws in her argument to distill essential feminine sins, so-called, or in quote, a feminine character structure, her words still mark a pivotal moment in the recovery of experiences obscured by theologies that claim to represent the universal human situation. It was not until three decades later, however, that we learned through an interview with Saving that her primary claim grew out of her maternal experience. She had begun her studies at Chicago 13 years earlier dur during World War II as the only woman pursuing a doctorate because in her words, quote, they were having trouble finding enough students even for a ministerial degree. She left the degree unfinished to marry and returned divorced and with a toddler. Although she effaces her own story as befit the standards of the time, she confesses that she wrote her essay while trying to take care of my daughter Emily, who was very small then. I was trying to be a responsible student and also a good mother, and sometimes it just seemed impossible. So even though she uses Margaret Mead's research on differences in female and male reproductive patterns to support her argument about women's proclivity towards underdevelopment or negation of the self, she is the one who has been schooled day by day, hour by hour, to, quote, transcend her own habitual patterns of thought to meet the child where he is at that moment, as she writes, abandoning one's own perspective to look at the world through his eyes. In other words, Saving's maternal knowledge, the sentence, I am also a mother, is written between the lines. In my earlier work, I described this maternal reasoning that had evaded me until I had children of my own as understated, but now I would call it suppressed, repressed, and discouraged. Why is maternal knowledge so obscured and occluded? and only not only internal to this classic text, but also to its long reception history. Some people, such as our own emeritus faculty, Professor Sally McFay, will blame the dominance of God's fatherhood, a theology and culture where God the Father reigns. But this seems insufficient to me, partly because it, it focuses so much on the male and the metaphorical, as the problem, rather than on the material realities of mothers. Isn't there also something about motherhood's very physicality, the pregnant and birthing body and bodily care of others that makes it so difficult to deal with as a source of knowledge or divine imagery? The, the central fact about sexual differences, in her words, that saving names still stands today despite decades of biogenetic engineering in every society, she writes, it is women, and only women, who bear children. Further, in every society, the person closest to the infant and young child is a woman, due to the physiology of lactation, even in societies where formula replaces breastfeeding. True, societies organize childcare in diverse ways. Extended networks of care are essential for human survival. Male involvement increases reproductive success, and many contemporary societies expect more from men. But as recent studies in anthropology and behavioral biology can confirm, there is no human society in which males have primary or even equal responsibility for the care of offspring. What do we do with this? Thankfully, U.S. society has progressed far from Nettie's time when motherhood was seen as every woman's preordained destiny, and gender theory of the last 40 years has made even clear that, bio that, that motherhood is not an unmitigated biological fact. It is actually one of the most social and interpersonal experiences, dyadic at its heart and utterly dependent for its success on a wider support network. Moreover, it is filled with multiple meanings that vary considerably across time and place. If there were a competition over where gender gets most powerfully institutionalized through social mores or theatrically performed through regulated social roles, then motherhood would be a good candidate for first place. However, 
And this is key. Motherhood complicates gender as socially constructed, perhaps more than many experiences, because it is never entirely separable from women's bodies. Whatever else it is, to borrow philosopher Sarah Ruddick's words, birth is physical, a transaction of bodies. As important, the acute care that follows birth, more prolonged for humans than other mammals, is also overwhelmingly physical. Entailing what Adrian Rich, author of a very well-known classic now of Women Born, describes this, this physical labor as the small, routine chores of socializing a human being, touching, wiping, bathing, feeding, burping, changing, holding, caring, rocking, hugging, soothing, dressing. I need to stop right here and acknowledge our potential resistance. In addition to political concerns about the historical and cross-cultural exploitation of women's reproductive and sexual capacities, why is it so hard to inquire into biological motherhood as source of knowledge without causing offense or discomfort? Why does it often evoke concern that we are leaving out adoptive mothers, other mothers, or men who cannot give birth, or that we are unfairly pressuring women who are not mothers and do not want to be? Why can't we see inquiring into corporeal dimensions of mothering as capable of expanding our understanding rather than excluding or entrapping us? Nancy Chodoro has the most famous psychoanalytic answer. Locating our emotional antipathy in our early experiences of our own mothers, in a culture in which only mothers mother but have little power outside the private sphere, so are loved, hated, and feared as ensnaring and rejecting. Although her theory is limited by Western middle-class heterosexual assumptions, the aversion that she is trying to understand is real. But I want to stress that the mere reflection on the fact that women give birth need not automatically mean that one is idealizing, essentializing, or ranking biological mothers as superior. We can identify birth giving and labor as a common and even valuable experience and source of knowledge without automatically suggesting that biological mothering is innately desirable, normative, or demeaning of other forms of caregiving. For some feminists, recognizing the biologically female body is a matter of political advocacy. As long as more than half a million women worldwide still die annually in pregnancy or childbirth, and women face other kinds of bodily harm, such as rape and sexual trafficking, it is irresponsible intellectual rhetoric to render material bodies as merely cultural constructions. But for me, understanding biological bodies is also a matter of epistemological curiosity and honesty. For the physical not only gains meaning within culture, it also influences meaning and shapes thought. That's my argument in a nutshell. And herein lies an age-old epistemological puzzle. What is the place of human physicality in, no in knowing? Made all the more challenging because we are talking about maternal physicality and theological knowledge. By turning to nursing in my earlier work, I jumped right into the thicket of this challenge. What does it mean to lactate, I asked, to have a body that sensing another's thirst lets down, drenching me with sweet smelling milk, does it alter knowing? In my search for an answer, Sarah Reddick's work on what she calls maternal thinking was pivotal. She was singular in the early 1980s for claiming as deserving of ethical and philosophical recognition the thought and intellectual capacities, metaphysical attitudes, and values that developed through mothering. Inspired by rich, and drawing on diverse philosophers who argue that human thought emerges within social practices, she studies the interests that shape maternal thought. Yet, when Rudick encounters resistance, 
and even what she calls an unease that I cannot name, when she argues that a distinctive kind of thinking arises from the work of mothers, she tries to get around the problem by casting her net wide, retaining the term maternal, because only women bear children, but defining it as inclusively as possible as a generic caring activity that anyone can perform. The maternal is a social category, she insists. Biological parenting is neither necessary nor sufficient. But by setting physiological activities of menstruating, pregnancy, birthing, nursing, what she calls birthing labor, and thereby transcending gender, she bites the hand that feeds her, superficially bracketing the corporeal dimensions even though they are intricately connected with mothering. So in the one book that actually makes a case for maternal knowledge, we discover in a section entitled, Where is the Female Body? that it has largely disappeared. I think the unease she cannot name was, has more to do than she realizes with the epistemological quagmire of women's birthing and nursing bodies. Certainly, if we want to achieve equity in domestic labor, or if we want to use maternal thought to foster peace, which was what Ruddick was trying to do, it renders it makes complete sense to downplay bodily differences. But if we hope to disrupt negative epistemological assumptions about bodies and knowledge that perpetuate injustice and violence, then we have to know more about the knowledge of birthing labor, or what I call maternal knowing instead of thinking, a term I prefer to Ruddick's because of its fuller bodied connotations. In a kind of phenomenology of the knowing internal to the act of nursing, I write and also a mother. I know physically through a muscular ache. Apart from the ache, I can scarcely know. In this knowing, few abstractions come between myself and the other. I know by knowing the feelings of the other physically because they are paradoxically both mine and not mine. I know by an effective connection that moves towards differentiation. I know immediately, tactilely, erotically, supposedly, quote, the lowest and least worthy of all human senses, according to classic Western theology and philosophy. As, as this account indicates, birthing labor subverts modern categories of mind and body, self and other, inside and outside. Psychoanalyst and philosopher Julia Kristeva writes profoundly from the, within the internal discourse of mothers, describing pregnancy as a publicly subversive state, a continuous separation, she says, a division of the very flesh. In pregnant bodies, I suggest, the self and other coexist. The other is both myself and not myself. Hourly, daily becoming more separate until that which was mine becomes irrevocably another, carried forth into the world and henceforth irreparably alien. That's actually Chris Davis' word. I don't know if I'd use alien, but other. This knowing that emerges resembles what educational theorist Nell Noddings describes as a feeling with the other that suspends judgment yet is not purely emotional. This embodied, reasoned feeling involves a circular process of physical sensation, momentary cognition, behavioral reaction, and a physical sensing and intellectual reading of the results, a trial and error strategy which has a distant resemblance to Catholic moral casuistry, a lost art case-based reasoning. This mode of knowing also challenges our conventional divisions between theory and practice because theory does not involve simply verbalizable knowledge, nor is practice simply unmediated action, but both are more fleeting and nebulous and relative and momentary. To go back to Ruddick, to her credit, she later admits her mistake in eclipsing the physical, even though she buries her admission in a footnote in a later chapter. By suppressing birth, late birthing labor, she concedes, she has colluded with an entire history of philosophical suspicion 
and denial of female bodies, thereby neglecting the reality that behind every child and all mothering, biological or adoptive, there is a woman who gave birth. Her effort to abstract the, the neutered mother from the crucial work on which it depends was defensive at, on, at best and part of a destructive history at worst. For it is precisely the very bodily differences that have worked most that have marked most women's bodies as more bodily than others, and that are the least amenable to reconstruction, women's menstruating, birthing, nursing bodies that have been seen as, quote, the source of irrationality and disorder. When birth figures in our philosophical history only as an absence, while other topics like death and sex receive the limelight, then birthing women are silenced. As important, Ruddick rewrites this history, or maybe more important is how she rewrites this history, by redefining the relationship between birthing labor and reason through a thick description of the practical knowing that emerges within the midst of intense physicality, vulnerability, eroticism, and bodily connectivity. Under the best of conditions in which most women don't have, but women tend to know, Ruddick says, trying to temper with these words, tend to know slightly, but still make her ultimate epistemological conclusion. In a way and to a degree that men do not, the cost of human flesh, knowledge that derives, quote, at least in part from an experience or appreciation of female birthing labor. This is just one case of what women know. Other people draw on bodies of other shapes and sizes to reach equally provocative but different insights. Recently, Catholic ethicist Christ Christina Trena, for example, draws on her disconcerting experience of orgasm while nursing to develop an ethic of eroticism that considers the complicated role of desire and pleasure in unequal relations of all kinds. Or, for another example, Jewish scholar Mara Benjamin shows how otherwise brilliant constructions of inner subjectivity in Martin Buber and Emmanuel Levinas occlude the one relationship that might have added further understanding in all the relationships that they consider, the mother-child and its attunement to the language of the body, thereby ignoring the one site that might have been capable of reorienting further religious and philosophical categories. But I am less interested in these examples, either Ruddick's or others, uh, that is, I'm less interested in what can be learned at this point, and I'm more concerned about how to value knowledge that emerges through bodies with mothers as a persuasive instance. These one-sentence summaries that I've just made don't do justice to sophisticated arguments, and they don't address whether or to what extent these scholars actually use bodily knowledge in their theological construction. My point, however, is more general. I flag these instances because they display knowledge emerging out of maternal embodiment, describing with concrete specificity varying body encounters within diverse cultural context. Thus, they retain a place for bodily knowledge while circumventing biological and sexual reductionism. In fact, contrary to the sort of women-centered feminism of the 1980s, I don't think women or mothers possess exclusive knowledge or a different kind of rationality. But also, in contrast to the social constructionism of the 1990s, I think bodies shape knowledge, including theological knowledge. And hence, I find helpful the return to the study of lived bodies that you find in thinkers like Iris Young or even going back to Adrian Rich's work and the use of a framework of epistemological uh, existential phenomenology. So I point to these, account, these accounts alongside my own and those of Ruddick, Saving, and even Brown Blackwell because I want to reorient our experiences about where and how theology emerges. Conventional assumptions about theology as static, conceptual, verbal, doctrinal, and textual have made it difficult, if not impossible, to see its physical moorings and its material grounding formulated in decisive ways at different times of life under mundane, impermanent, non-elite, and practical conditions. 
If birthing labor seems antithetical to reason, then children's immature and growing bodies are even more disconcerting. For much of Christian history, children have not been seen as capable of progressing in faith until the age of reason. Although this view has protected vulnerable children from inappropriate and unjust expectations, it has also diminished respect for their religious experience and ideation. Many who engage in the daily care of children and are transformed by the practice can recognize this. Children earn our esteem if we let them, even though their capacity to shape knowledge, including that of faith traditions, has been routinely overlooked. So to stop with maternal knowledge, as many feminist scholars do, and as my limited time and space would recommend, that would perpetuate a long-standing, although unrecognized, injustice. Just as birthing labor complicates gender as socially constructed, so also does age complicate our assumption about human diversity and social construction. For regardless of how societies construct age, all people start out life as small. And most undergo immense physical and social growth between birth and age 25. In fact, the brain itself doubles in size in the first year and keeps maturing until approximately 20, our mid-20s. Smallness and growth receive widely varying cultural interpretation, but like birth and labor, these traits have an indelible physical dimension that is not entirely amenable to change and that often leads to discrimination. Yet age difference and ageism toward the young are almost entirely disregarded in religious studies. When I was eight or nine, I promised myself I would never lie again. Whether it was in response to some lie that had gone awry or some other reason, I really don't remember. But I do remember how solemnly I committed myself. No one was in the immediate vicinity provoking this pledge. I think I was just biking around the neighborhood. Although I no doubt had heard about truth-telling in my family, school, and Protestant church that we attended. In the woods at church camp or looking at the stars from the back seat, I sometimes wondered why is there nothing, at, anything at all, rather than nothing? only to discover that this question unsettled camp counselor and parent alike. <laughs> it bothered me too, and I didn't like thinking about it for long because I got the creeps, picturing nothing. And years later, I learned that a famous philosopher had called this the fundamental question in metaphysics. Now, this does not mean I had arrived. It means Martin Heidegger did not get all that far. <laughs> well, better yet, young children are capable of asking big questions. Children often know themselves, ourselves, as deeply faithful, even if they do not convey this to those around them. Their reserve is partly from adults who actually discourage children from asking profound questions. Um, Matthew Gareth has done some interesting research on this, that school-aged children quickly learn that only useful questioning is expected of them. But adult discouragement does not end our exploration as children. In looking back on our own childhood, Nettie observes, I was as deeply and truly religious at but nine years of age as I have ever been at any age. And such childhood conviction is, again, like maternal knowledge, no more innate or natural. Rather, for children, such thought emerges in social contexts often guided by non-elite but deeply committed women. For Nettie, this was her grandmother, from which she gained much of her thoughtfulness. The person her biographer identifies as, quote, her first religious teacher, and, quote, someone who shared her daily life in a manner quite distinct from a clergyman. Our work in theology is haunted by our childhoods and the children we ourselves once were, as religion and literature scholar Stephanie Paulsell observes. 
At the heart of much, perhaps even most scholarship on religion, she says, there is a child hiding, recognize or not. And neither she or I mean this in a Freudian sense of pathology, but as a facet of spiritual life and theological construction. However, when religion scholars talk about, quote, our own experience, we rarely articulate it as our childhood experience thus truncating the temporal and evolving character of events that inform our reflection. And this is partly because this adds yet another layer of impossibility to our work as Paul, Paul Sell herself remarks. Understanding children's experience and knowledge is complicated. They have little, they have left behind little documentation. Adult memory distorts what track record we have from our own childhoods. And only recently has ethnographic study begun to take children seriously. And even here, studies such as sociologist Christian Smith's research on teen teenagers as a good example are sometimes notably unsympathetic. Citations of, of Smith's work often emphasize, almost always emphasize it, how youth fall short. Their quote, moralistic therapeutic deism, rather than their unique non-adult ways of knowing. This bias reflects a deeper bias in religious communities that education is all about adults forming children and seldom about how children and adolescents form us. By and large, children and teens remain unseen and unheard in religious scholarship and interpretation of sacred texts, and when they do appear, they are essentialized, sentimentalized, or criticized, easy targets for our projection and complaint rather than sources of theological promise. Help comes from an unlikely direction. Karl Rahner, a prominent 20th century Jesuit theologian who actually had little immediate responsibility for children, offered in an quite frequently cited article, Reasons Internal to Christianity to Think Again About Children. He describes childhood as openness, even infinite openness. By this, he partly means trust, deep elemental and ultimate trust, which seems inexhaustible in its endurance. But its qualities escape easy depiction. Stated most starkly, openness is, quote, these are his words, total self-abandonment to the incomprehensible infinitude of the ineffable mystery. Oh, there's a theolo theologian for you. But <laughs> this definition so closely resembles his understanding of God that it suggests how proximate he sees childhood to knowledge essential to the Christian life. He is not just referring to children here, however, but neither is he talking metaphorically, which is a crucial distinction since we like to idealize children as metaphors of hope or as a time of innocence, uh, of evil and suffering. He is talking literally about the theological vocation of children as children and about mature childhood in adulthood. Childhood not as secondary and incidental, but as an inherent factor in our lives, a reality that has definitive and enduring validity in God's sight. In short, to know God in, his, in Rahner's view, look at children and our own childhood, which echoes back to Jesus in the Gospels and Martin Luther in the Reformation. Now, this seems almost incomprehensible because adults cannot help but assume that as adults we surpass where we have been as children and that as Christians, mature faith lies somewhere out in front of us. But uh, a Christian view of time upsets our ordinary linear and progressive perspective in which one stage follows another, leaving childhood behind as subordinate and preparatory. Instead, childhood goes forward with us, Rana reminds us, not only in the decisions we make, but as, an invaluable, in, as invaluable in, its, in itself as a time when certain matters occur that can only occur and can occur at no other time. Childhood touches divinity in a special way of its own, in his words. In a word, children have a vocation that is as essential to, to Christian life, if not more so, than our purpose as adults. 
Their task or claim upon us is to help us become the children we began to be in our own childhood. Again, not metaphorically, but in actuality. For in childhood, he writes, our first intimations of God are attained. Now, Paltzell worries that Rahner's category of openness is too sweeping and abstract, susceptible to adult fantasy and projection onto children. But I think it captures something valuable about a Christian reconception of time and children that others can fill in with the complexities of particular childhoods. Paulcell goes back to Augustine, but I think we can look around us. When the adult members of a small urban congregation in Buenos Aires grew increasingly unsettled by the poverty and social problems surrounding them, it was children, according to Professor of Applied Theology Nancy Bedford, who played a major role, in, it was children who played a major role in pushing the congregation to deliberate and take action. Her testimony on how God's spirit in her words used the voices of children is worth hearing at length. I would hold, she writes, that the questions of young children when taken seriously are often among the most important catalysts in the process of discernment, especially in societies where small children and their conversation are valued highly, as in Argentina. Their questions are insistent, often incisive, and display an unconscious hermeneutic of suspicion. Some questions posed by my oldest daughter, three years old at the time, that were significant to me in clarifying my priorities were, does that woman out sleep outside at night? Why? Shouldn't we find her a place on the street? Does she, that was an observation made on the street. Does God give all people food or just some? asked after giving thanks for the food. Bedford concludes with a condensed verbatim of a conversation with her daughter that took place over a couple days about whether God is active if invisible and her daughter's own experience of hearing the spirit tell her in her words, we need to find a place to live for those people that sleep outside and teach the bad people to be good and share with the poor people. That Bedford tucks this reflection in a long footnote should come as no surprise, given the ambiguous reception of children's knowledge. It appears in an essay otherwise devoted to moving liberation theology from global <coughs> pronouncements on social justice to concrete steps, or what Bedford calls little moves against destructiveness. We might ask why it's relegated to the footnote, and more important, whether the theological argument in the chapter as a whole is not even more indelibly shaped by her daughter and children than she realizes. Children see adults, see what adults, uh, even the best liberation theologians miss, but Bedford's submerged account also reveals that children do do theology, a capacity that is actually disconcerting given the assumptions that we harbor about them. This makes pastoral and theological work tricky as another scholar says, one cannot, in his words, take children seriously in worship and at the same time want, for example, foreign workers to be deported without further ado. Modern adults have dispensed with our discomfort by going along with 20th century media in which children say the darndest things, <laughs> reflecting a society that's captivated by the perception of children as cute but convinced that they really do not know much, that they lead lives of emotional and philosophical and spiritual simplicity. In theology, this is one more place where a fundamental truncation, where we have a truncation of how and where theology happens. Diff I'm all, yeah. In static, adult, textual, and established context, not among the immature, dependent, vulnerable, and growing, and the chaos and unpredictability that surrounds children. When it comes to theology, as Munson and Dickinson had pointed out with Nettie, women like Nettie spent inordinate amounts of time and energy justifying and apologizing for their desire to be taken as intellect, intelligent individuals. Indeed, they write, it took great conviction and persistence for women simply to convince themselves that they were worthy of the public forum, much less convince others. 
In this lecture, I simply extend the effort. Exploring birthing mothers and growing children is two of the places where we least expect theological knowledge to emerge. Given theological history and its negative view of bodies and human temporality, it is hard to imagine how the passage of time, bodily changes, and certain physical life phases shape theological knowledge. But physical bodies matter in the construction, presentation, and persuasion of theological knowledge, more than we have realized, admitted, or understood. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited about the ways that you are helping us both focus on children and focus on bodies um, and the corporal realities that come with those. I am curious about what you would do with the corporal realities of folks who identify as trans or transgender and folks who, whose bodies are intersex, uh, especially given that you said that only women give birth and you are trying to challenge the cultural construction of gender. Um, but the reality is that there are folks who do not identify as women who do menstruate, who do lactate, and who do give birth. So I'm just curious as to what you might do with that or how that might help push some of this further or how that might challenge some of this. My sense is that they would have the same, not the same, but experiences out of those physical experiences regardless of how you label them. Like, why do we have to label them? Um, I guess then I'd have to say only persons who, I, you know, I'd have to take women out of the only. I'd still want to claim that there'd be knowledge, yeah. fruitful knowledge, obtained through that experience. I guess you'd have to just drop the term, but that's, it's complicated. I mean, I'm not exactly sure, yeah. Would you want to? Well, I think what you started, when you talk yeah. about birthing knowledge and lactating knowledge, that active practical piece totally makes sense. It's just what happens when the, the labels that we claim or are put upon us don't work. Right. They are. That's, just, yeah. just something to play with. Yeah, it's, they, don't, they don't work. <laughs> I miss the menopausal body. Oh, you miss the menopausal part? <laughs> I miss the menopausal body, and I'm wondering about the knowledge that comes from the receding of certain functions, um, and if you could speak to that part of the, the life cycle. These are hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I mean, it's interesting because I want to be careful about making like essentialist claims, but there is something really physical about menopause that if you experience it, and I think it's a reiteration of menstruation, you, you feel the dictates and the force of your physicality and its impact on your mentality, that it's not like you can separate out um, your body from your thought. And I think, I do think that those, you know, menstruating and, and menopause are similarly hormonally driven and they are steady reminders to those of us who experience them how intricately connected our, I mean, we don't really have a word for it, our mind, body, or our being is. Um, so, 
I have sort of bracketed aging, but it's definitely present in my thinking about all of this. Um, and awareness of, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I lean, I need to shout. Oh, back there. I, yeah. uh, Dr. Michael my name is Gregory Taylor, and I was born on the day that um, Antoinette Blackwell was ordained. And mm -hmm. I actually embody the thinking of the book, Maternal Thinking Toward a Political Peace. And I learn a lot from listening to what mothers go through carrying children and bringing them into the world. And I'd like to know what your thoughts are in that area. What was the last part of? I said, I um, learn a lot from listening to mothers in the nine months that they carry children. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, and I believe that the polit that <coughs> I believe that in this particular area that is where peace will be found in understanding what mothers go through when they are carrying their children. I think what Sarah Ruddick, I mean, her subtitle, I, I actually didn't, can't tell if you could see her subtitle, but um, her subtitle really was towards a, toward a ethic or a philosophy of peace. So, you know, she really is, even in that chapter that she adds at the end, making a case that women do have a sense of the preciousness. She uses the word cost, and I think she's actually using some other um, women, Simone Weil, who, you know, if you bear flesh and care for flesh, uh, that is, persons, you have a deep sense of its value. And um, that's really, I have to say, you know, back to the experience of birthing and nursing, you can find women who write, it's, it's pretty acute in that time where you recognize that everybody was an infant, and then you have a hard time imagining harming anybody. Um, and it, I mean, for me, that's a distant memory. But I remember how acute it was, and if you read narratives of, of early mothers, you'll find that kind of uh, language. Um, and I think it's pretty powerful. So I do think, and it's interesting, when I have preached on Mother's Day, basically the, the congregation got a uh, haranguing of the origin of Mother's Day, which has nothing to do with romanticizing mothers and everything to do with peace. Um, and a lot of Southern history there, too, and resisting sending sons off north and south, mothers joining together to fight. And so, um, so I do think it's not surprising that Ruddick took that task and other women have experienced that. Yeah. I saw, yeah, you've got the mic. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. This was great. Um, I, I found myself wondering about um, our friend, um, Mary McClintock Fulkerson's idea that when we pay careful attention to bodies and to difference, it challenges the whole received set of categories for thinking theologically. Now, of course, we could say we don't really need categories. That's one of the things I think your work says. But given that we do need to think in categories, sometimes it's useful on occasion. How far are, are you um, ready to... Uh, just want to hear you talk a little bit more about how far you're ready to go to challenge the traditional doctrines of <laughs> sin and humanity and God and Jesus and all that and, and disrupt it with this maternal knowing and childhood knowledge. Where, where are we, how are we going to upend all that? <laughs> going back to the podium. All right, I dropped the last paragraph. <laughs> now I get to read it. Well, um, okay, <clears throat> different from classical theology, I, I'm not really trying to say anything bold or grand about God, which is so disciple, my, for <laughs> my formation. And, and what I mean by that, indeed, theories of the Godhead or Trinity tend to diminish the bodily and social realities. 
behind our metaphors, turning conceptions of God as either father or mother or any other thing into symbols that lose sight of the real bodies of those sometimes harmed by this transposition into doctrine. Indeed, I suggest that thoughtful reconsideration of bodily aspects of mother and childhood just might expand our understandings of ourselves and God. So I do have some issues with categories, not so much sin, not the, anthropo the anthropological categories of, that we try to figure out about human nature, but I, I, I do see real limitations in our efforts to conceptualize the Trinity and other, um, yeah, and other things in the tradition. I mean, they're useful in a very temporary way, I guess I would say. Yeah. They're temporary solutions, but that we forget that they're temporary. Thank you, Bonnie.